Okay. Good morning, everybody. Hope you have a had a good weekend and caught up on your sleep. Some of you did. Some of you probably didn't. That's all right. Okay. So let's begin um, the final two weeks of lecture, um, starting with lecture 39. And today, um, what we're going to talk about is how we can extend the range of ZVS. So we started looking at a resonant inverter design last time, um, and I will just sort of quickly uh, scroll through that. Um, so here's the design we were looking at. It was a LCC resonant inverter, and basically what we did uh, was design the resonant tank, which is pick out the resonant tank components for the given specifications, right? And the way we proceeded uh, was we had two really operating points that were given. One was um, the voltage, the minimum voltage we needed at the output when, the, when there was no load. And then there was the normal operating point, which was at 25 watts and a particular voltage. Right? And so uh, the way we proceeded was that we converted those operating points, first of all, into an output characteristic. And then we use the output characteristic uh, parameters to uh, figure out two uh, parameters. One, the open circuit gain, the H infinity, and the other, the output impedance, uh, looking back into the tank with the input shorted, right, the Z output zero. Uh, and we got sort of specs on those, uh, H infinity and Z output zero, uh, at least on the magnitudes of those. And then <clears throat> we used uh, those to then go in and figure out the tank components. And what we were able to do was really since we had two parameters that were specified, we, we were able to uh, narrow it down to two tank parameters. And since our tank really had three components, one of the component values was um, sort of a, a free variable that we could pick. Right? Um, anyway. Uh, we also showed that our choice of that free variable, um, so <clears throat> uh, since XP was something that we uh, found and so CP was kind of fixed, so what we really had was a choice of what, how we picked L and CS. Uh, what we found was that that choice really didn't really give us any additional leeway in getting a different value for R critical, which is the value of load up to which point we would get ZVS, right? Uh, and so, um, really, uh, our choice of uh, what value of CS we picked was quite arbitrary. Uh, we picked it to be three times uh, CP and got a value for CS, and therefore we were able to figure out L, right? So that was our design process, and we were able to basically determine that uh, for our operating point, or nominal operating point, which was uh, a load equivalent to 900 ohms, we were below the critical value, and so we would get ZVS, and so we were happy, right? Okay, so what if we were not happy? What if there was another operating point which was at, uh, at a value of R that was greater than R critical? That's our next discussion. How do we... How do we change things to actually maintain ZVS if our nominal operating point was above the R critical that we got, or we had a second nominal operating point um, that was greater than R critical, or whatever the case may be, we wanted to extend this R critical range, right? Um, and, and basically get ZVS beyond that. All right, so. That's where we begin. Um, all right, so in order to kind of figure this out, let's take a step back and first ask, well, what is the problem that we're trying to address? And so we can sort of you now look at it afresh and see if there are things that we skipped or we could have done or we can still do to make things better, all right? So first of all, let's see, um, I mean, we kind of said it, but let's just sort of recap this. Um, and ask the question, well, 
we have these two extreme cases with r equal to 0 and r equal to infinity. Let's sort of convince ourselves that the, which one of these is a problem by first figuring out um, the input impedances at these two extreme cases. Right. So our z input 0, right, our z input 0 is basically looking in here, z i, um, and z i 0 is basically shorting the uh, output. And so that is simply equal to um, j xs, right? And in value, that would then simply be j times uh, 734.2 ohms, right? And that's clearly a positive number, uh, positive as in it's a positive j number, a positive imaginary number. So that basically says um, that uh, we have a inductive impedance and therefore a lagging current and therefore ZVS, right, which is what we said already, which is sort of to get some numbers in there, uh, that's what it is, right. So that's not a problem. Let's look at the other extreme, Z input infinity. Right. So now we look in here, uh, Z input infinity, and under Z input infinity, uh, we basically open circuit this. Right. Um, now what we have is J, sorry, is J XS plus J XP, right, which is basically J XS plus XP. Um, and if we do the math there, that's equal to minus uh, J uh, 764.8 ohms, right? Uh, and that's a, that's a negative number, right? Or a negative J number, right? So that's a capacitive Impedance, uh, which means uh, we don't get ZVS, we get ZCS, but no ZVS. Okay. So the the problem case is clearly uh, Z input infinity, and somewhere in between is where the transition occurs, right? And in fact, we know where that transition occurs because that's really this R critical value. And that R critical value is, we computed last time, was 1468 ohms. And which for our nominal case, R norm uh, of 900 ohms is fine, right? So in general, as long as R, the load, is less than this R critical value, then we get ZVS. But if R exceeds this R, Critical value, then we get no ZVS. Okay, or we get ZCS. Okay, um, so what do we do? How do we increase our critical? So how do we how do we improve our ZVS range? What can we do? Can we change these? LCSCP. What do you guys think? So R critical in general is given by this expression, right? This is the general, this is how for any tank, irrespective of what the tank structure is, that's what you're going to get for R, that's the R critical. We, d we derived that a couple of lectures ago. For the particular case of the um, LCC or any structure, any uh, tank structure where which you have JXS and JXP sort of um, strung the way it is here, uh, we proved 
that in that case R critical then becomes this. All right. This is this is true for um, when you have uh, the following structure. All right. If you go back and look at the derivation, that's all we assumed. Right. So for that structure, R critical is this. But this is something that comes straight from our specifications of our tank. And H infinity also comes straight from our specification. So this is, these are fixed. Can't change those. Given a specification that you have to meet this open circuit voltage requirement and that operating point requirement that just pinned your output characteristic. Those pinned Z output 0 and Z infinity, H infinity. So really, you, you're bowled out. There's not much you can do here. In fact, that's true. You're bowled out. You can't do anything. If you want those characteristics, those output characteristics, that, those two operating points, there's nothing this tank will can do to give you a better ZVS range. You just got to throw this tank out. And what do you do? Start from scratch, find new tanks. Well, I think there's a better way. That's what we're going to talk about. A better way to fix the problem than throwing the baby with the bathtub and starting from scratch redesigning, looking for tanks that may work, and, and spending another two lectures going over the same thing again, right? No. Got to do it in five minutes, maybe ten, so that we have to do the FCQs. All right, ideas. How do we fix this? All right, so I've given you a hint. It's not this tank, right? You got to modify this tank. Do something to it. Give you another hint. We just add one component. The one in the homework. Okay. Huh? Add an add a extra inductor. Or something? Add an extra inductor. I'll take more votes first, and then we'll talk about it. Right. Any other ideas? <coughs> Using LLC. Use an LLC. All right, but that's redesigning the whole thing. And who knows what the answer? Who, who knows what the answer? Take a C and put L. Oh, take a C and put L. Okay. Um, what's the value of the L? How do you know it's going to meet the requirements? The other requirements. All the other requirements we've been meeting, right? All right. Any more takers? Somebody said add an L. Oh, okay, go ahead. Add, add damping like an input filter. Add an input filter. Um, not sure I follow. What would the input filter do? Uh, like an input filter to a standard PWM controlled converter. Okay. And how would that help increase ZVS range? Add it some sort of transformation stage. Transformation stage. Nah. I mean, I don't know. Um, I, I guess that you could like try different things, and some of them might work. But in terms of like a simple solution, uh, let's start with somebody saying, and let's add an inductor. An inductor at the you know in parallel with the input to make it more inductive. All right. What were your suggestions? Same thing. Was to add an inductor where? Parallel with that? All right. Why, why do you say that will work? Uh, because it adds some inductive to the Z. Because in that case, ZI would be that, for example, that inductor in series or in parallel with the ZI, which right now we have. Okay. So make the overall. So can I put any inductor? Well, probably not, but. It will depend upon how, how much we want to extend the ZBS range. 
was that that would be sort of an extra inductive. Okay, I want to extend the ZVS change to infinity. All the way to R infinity. All right. You guys are on the right track. Yep. We will add. So you want to add? We'll add an inductor. So you want to extend the ZVS to be up to infinity? Yeah. So probably the L should be equals to J ZI infinity. And the impedance of that inductor which we add. OK. Um, you're on the right track, but that's not quite true, right? All right, so let, let's first convince ourselves that adding an inductor at the input is really an OK decision. We don't know if it's the best decision, but let's first convince ourselves it's an OK decision. And the OK part is that it does not change H infinity and Z output 0, right? Because those two determined your output characteristic, and we don't want those to change, right? So. Suppose we went ahead and we followed the good advice of our brilliant students, uh, and we add this extra inductance, Lx, all right, here. All right, the two things we want, don't want to change are H infinity, right, uh, to here. What is H infinity? Well, H infinity is simply the output voltage here. We call this Vr with Vr R going to, Z, uh, R going to infinity, right, which is really Voc, right, over this voltage, Vs, okay, which is basically V open circuit over uh, Vs. Right? And adding this inductor, Lx, does not change Vs, because you've got a voltage source across it, right, with value Vs. And the tank doesn't see any change, and so you will get the same H infinity, right? So H infinity nu uh, is just equal to uh, H infinity old, right? So or let me do this way. H infinity new. So our H infinity new is the same as H infinity old. All right, let's check uh, Z output zero. All right, and Z output zero is the output impedance with the input shorted. Right. So let's do. Uh, let's actually change the color. the output 0 is with the input shorted, and as soon as I short it, Lx goes away. Right? So this does not change either. So this new is the same as Z output 0 old. Okay. Now let's see if it actually does any good, adding that inductor there. Right? So um, what we are interested in is um, Uh, Z input infinity, right? That was the thing that was troubling us because that was negative. So Z input infinity is now, uh, this is the new value, is going to equal, uh, well, the old Z input infinity is basically uh, looking in here like that. And so I can basically replace this, the circuit for calculating Z input nu as follows. Um, so I can basically model this as that. This is Z input infinity. That's the old Z input infinity. And then I've added this inductor um, Lx here. Um, and this then is what I'm looking for. That's my Z input infinity nu, right? So that then is simply equal to um, Lx in parallel with Z input infinity, the original one, 
All right, let's say um, Lx is equal to some j xx. Uh, we know what z input infinity was. That was was this. So our z input infinity nu is then equal to j x x uh, times minus j 4.8 divided by j x minus j 764.8 right and I can cancel out this j and this j okay so what do I want z input infinity nu to to look like I want it to be inductive right so I want that number to actually come out as positive so right now what I have is uh, minus j x x 764.8 divided by x x minus 7 oops 64.8 right and I want this guy uh, to be positive j right so so it's not an arbitrary choice what do I have to do what values of L can I pick or what? Less than 764. yeah xx has to be less than 764 so I get a negative in the denominator the whole thing comes out to be positive right so the inductance has to be smaller than a particular value so I get enough inductive current flowing through that to actually make the whole current coming from the switches uh, look lagging right so I want to have enough of this extra current um, coming in all right so this basically says um, uh, that particular requirement I will just write it here want uh, z input infinity nu um, as positive j and that basically says that um, xx needs to be less than 764.8 ohms right raise it from here and once you have that you can compute what um, lx you need because omega s lx is xx uh, and that has to be less than 764.8 ohms right and you can compute um, given your switching frequency you can figure out what lx you need okay all right that's um, that's okay well let, let's see what happens to um, z input zero once we do this all right so so that's our that's our design um, all right and what we found was that uh, z, the z input infinity nu came out to be um, down here minus jx x 764.8 over xx minus 764.8 right now let's figure out what is um, z input 0 nu uh, and that is going to be what well, it's again going to be um, the old z input 0. And that's basically just looking in here with this thing sorted. That's your original z input 0. Um, and now you add j x x to that, You're basically your lx. And then this is your z input 0 new 
right? So that's just uh, j x x in parallel with uh, z input 0 and z input 0 is uh, let me just first write z input 0 over j x x plus z input 0 that's j x x uh, plus j 734.2 over j x x plus j 734.2. multiply okay so this thing since xx is positive uh, is also going to be positive so we're okay all right so as long as all right, um, so as long as we pick x x as less than 764.8 ohms uh, both both um, z input 0 new and z input infinity new are in Okay, so we have an inf our ZVS range just went off to infinity. Now we can, you don't worry about what value of R we have, since at z equal to zero we have inductive, z equal to infinity we have inductive. We have this theorem which says that the span in between for any um, lossless reactive tank is going to be monotonic um, and if the two and the other theorem which says that if you have um, the same thing on both ends if you have inductive and inductive then there is no R critical value you will always have inductive if you have capacitive and capacitive and both extreme cases then again you have no R critical value and it will always be capacitive right? so now since we have inductive at both uh, extreme cases it's just going to be inductive throughout. All right. So one question here: yeah. uh, still, z i zero is less than z i infinity here. Well, that's okay. Z i zero is always le you want z i zero to be less than z i infinity. But we haven't checked that, right? So that's we're going to discuss that next. Right. So first, let's sort of be happy for a moment until we have become unhappy uh, that we are able to achieve ZBS, right? What is the, what's the price we've paid for it? Oh, we'll take a look in a second, right? All right, so let's, so, so this is all sort of algebra. Now let's pick some numbers um, and actually see what happens to other things that we care about, right? So, uh, let's pick. All right, so that was that was good. Now let's pick something. So we know we have to pick x x to be less than seven sixty four point eight. Um, just to keep the math simple, I'm going to pick x x is equal to uh, seven thirty four point two ohms. All right. I just make it match my z input 0, right? Well, what does this do, first of all, to uh, z input infinity nu? That's going to be uh, minus j734.2 into 764.8 divided by uh, uh, 734.2 minus 764.8. That, if you do the math, is comes out to be J uh, 18,350 ohms, roughly. All right? So, 
rough calculation. Right? Equal to 18.35 kilo ohms. Okay? Is that good or bad? It's good, right? Yeah, because before we had Z input infinity of 764 ohms. Now it's just become kilo ohms. So this is great. That means that our low lo low <coughs> no load um, current is even slower, right? And our low load uh, efficiency will be high. Right? So that's good. Great. What about Z input zero new? That's uh, JXX, which is 734.2 uh, times 734.2 over, um, actually, yeah, could have done it from there. Uh, no, the formula wasn't even right there. All right, so this is um, 734.2 plus 734.2. It's basically 734.2 in parallel with itself, right? Let me just go back and fix that typo. There should be an xx here. Right. Okay. Um, so what does this give us? Well, it's basically two equal impedances in parallel, so it's just going to be half the value. So this is 367.2. I can't even do my math. Sounds right. Sounds right, should be right. Yep. Okay, how about this? Good? Okay, bad? Not so great, right? Your currents have doubled. Your input current, for the same output current, your input current has doubled. So you're going to have lo higher losses. Your transistors will have to carry twice as much current. You have to buy, buy fatter, bigger uh, inverter transistors. So not so good. Not good. Okay. Input current doubled. All right. So you're going to have at heavy load, or at full load, you're going to have higher losses. So it's a trade-off, right? You, you really have to think about your application and see if you are really uh, dominated by switching losses, right? If that switching losses are killing you, you need ZVS over a wider range, well, then you do this. On the other hand, if your conduction losses are dominating, then you don't do it, right? But this is a very simple trick, trick that you will probably employ a million times in your careers if you build resident converters or soft switching converters in general. You simply go and add a what's called a shunt inductor across your inverter or basically at the input of your resident tank to get that extra bit of inductive energy to help you soft switch, right? It's the kind of trick I will suggest to a grad student. If, he, if he's kind of tried everything else and it isn't working, well, all right, go ahead, add a little inductance. Well, we'll make it work. Okay, there's always, this is the always, the foolproof method to always make something work. It's a hack. It just makes things work, right? But it's a good hack, and it works. Um, so it's useful to know, okay? All right. Um, how would you actually, so, so, so hacks apart, which is sort of you just go and add, add in inductance. Uh, uh, it's actually, in many cases, something that you would fairly commonly do, right? And uh, this brings us to another um, sort of topic, which is that um, many times you need to use a transformer in your resonant converter, right? Either because you need galvanic isolation, you need a transformation, 
uh, voltage transformation which is much higher than what you would want to get from your tank itself. Uh, and one of the things you want to do with a resonant converter is take advantage of the fact that you have a transformer there and not be bullied by its parasitics. Right? Transformer parasitics always hurt you in a PWM converter. Right? They act, add these extra spikes of voltages which key tend to blow up your transistors and then you have to put snubbers and clamps and all that stuff. Well here you can actually take advantage of your transformer parasitics. So this is how you would do the circuit uh, if you uh, basically had a transformer. Right? So you had to put a transformer in, in there. That basically means, well, there's the, the basic nuts and bolts. But how many times have you built a transformer and it actually was like that, right? Never. Then the transformer is also has its magnetizing inductance and also has a leakage inductance, which I can show on either side. Right? That's a real transformer. That's what, when you build a transformer, that's what you get. All right? So, well, now here's what you do. If I want to actually take advantage of all of these components that are now there as part of this transformer, well, I use this leakage inductance as my L. I go ahead, add a capacitor CS, add a capacitor CP, and I'm done. Here's my resonant tank. Here's my LLC with the extra LX, which is this guy. Is yeah. LCC? Isn't that L? Oh, I meant to say LCC. Sorry. That's what we were talking about. Yeah. Uh, although the LLC can also be made from the same transformer. Right? Basically, I just kick, I just flip this over and throw out CP, and it becomes the LLC. But, yeah, we are talking about the LCC. Uh, so it becomes the LCC with, with this extra LX. Just two extra capacitors, one transformer and two capacitors, and you're done. Right? So here's your, here's your transformer, and your two capacitors. Okay. Um, did I want to say anything else here? Um, well, the only thing I will say here is that um, this, this looks very simple and easy. Um, in practice, to build a transformer with a very specific leakage inductance uh, is not that easy. Right? Uh, getting magnetizing inductance is probably easier, but getting a precise leakage inductance is not so easy. Uh, well, then you go to sort of planar transformers where you can sort of do much, much more precision uh, craftsmanship um, where at least you have repeatability of design. So once you figure it out through some FEM analysis and some tests, maybe you, you'll get the same thing again uh, the next time you build it. Right? But even there, it's not guaranteed with um, differences in core material and, and variations and temperature and all that stuff. Yep. Do we need to exactly say how much leakage inductance do we need? Because, you know, we just need XS, not know <clears throat> the value of the magnetizing induction. Yeah. So whatever the magnetizing, you know, the leakage inductance we are getting, right, then we choose CS to have the access to Right. Unfortunately, it's the leakage inductance, which is the harder one to predict. And so you're right. So the magnetizing, we may not be that uh, worried about the exact precise, precise value as long as it's below a certain value. But the leakage determines your resonant frequencies, right? Yeah, you know, what I'm trying to say is that we shouldn't be worried about the leakage inductance because whatever the leakage would be, for example. Oh, this this is the leakage, right? Right, right. Then we choose CS to have the... Oh, yeah. Well, you're assuming you're going to make one of these, right? 
I'm talking about a factory which is churning out. You, you don't want them to be buying different CS for every every part that comes out of an assembly line. Right? So this has to be a process which can produce a million components and they all work at the same frequency. Otherwise you're gonna be tuning each one of each one of your products for a different thing. Now that's what I mean. Yeah. I mean in the lab you can do whatever you want. That's why academics love this this stuff. Right? Uh, yeah. Okay, um, let's let's sort of uh, pause here and uh, and sort of uh, wrap up for today. We'll pick up um, something interesting for next time. Um, but I want to just take a few minutes to go through the FCQ and hand those out, and then I'll let Ali um, sort of. Okay, so what are we supposed to do, Ali? Am I supposed to read something? Mm. Right. So I think you're supposed to administer this. So why don't yeah. you read read it out? And then here's this, and I will I will not even be here. Ooh. I don't have enough space. All right, so wait, wait. I'll delete something here. Um, all I'll say about the FCQ is please give your detailed opinions because it'll help improve this course. And I really appreciate any feedback you give. So, uh, and I will be out of here. Um, and if the recording is still going on, I will just ask the people who are remote to do the FCQs uh, online, I guess. I think you, they, all of you have received those emails. All right. Thank you. 